minute or so early, but we'll begin tonight's meeting, uh, August 5th. Call the meeting to order for the select board. Uh, as always, the first thing we have to do is approve the agenda. I don't know if there's any additions or comments or changes necessary. It doesn't appear to be, so somebody would love to make a motion to approve the agenda. Make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Okay. Uh, no further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Consent agenda items just consist of the minutes of the July 22nd meeting. Somebody would love to approve that. Make a motion to approve the minutes of the July 22nd meeting. Okay. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 And this is a public comment period. Is there anybody here from the public, general public, that wishes to speak before we begin? Seeing none, we'll move forward. Uh, first thing on the agenda is to um, interview a development review board member, possible member. Who might that be? Eric? No, me, Alex. Alex, you want to come up Alex and sit? <clears throat> Might have to turn the mic on. Is it Alec or Alex? Alex. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you're interested in jumping in uh, on the development review board? Yeah, I think it'd be interesting. Uh, my wife and I just moved to Waterbury from Burlington. Um, thought it'd be an interesting way to kind of get to know neighbors and the community and <laughs> do my small part. Yeah, it might be an interesting way to get to know neighbors at, yeah. at times, from what I understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, were you on any other boards in Burlington? No, okay. I was not. Uh, this would be my first board. Um, any other interests other than, I mean, what what's driving you to? Sure. Um, I'm a builder, um, and I also do uh, historic preservation consulting work. Um, so I kind of would come into the design review from that viewpoint. Um, not you know adverse to all development, but kind of you know keeping an eye on it and seeing how it goes and making sure that it's part of a, a wider vision for Waterbury. <coughs> <laughs> You're just happy to see somebody yeah, take exactly. the position, right? <laughs> um, well, we have another contractor here, and I'm an ex-GC. Uh, do basically site work now. Um, so I think, you know, that background can come in handy at times. You know, yeah, I think so. Process. Considering the makeup of the board now, I, I was on the DRB for quite some time, and um, so now we have a architect, an engineer, possibly a builder. It'll <laughs> uh, be a, interesting, a locksmith. <clears throat> yep. Well-rounded. It'll be a good addition. Well, thank you. So the term is for just? It'll be um, a three-year term ending April 30th, 2022. Wow. Alex, what's your last name? Tolstoy, T-O-L-S-T-O-I. Tolstoy. 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 Yeah. Well, mine is Viennes, and everybody pronounces it Vien, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, we won't drag you through the pain any longer. If somebody wishes to uh, approve Alex's three-year term, ending in 20... 22, uh, we can let him off the hook for the night. I'd make a motion to uh, appoint Alex to a three-year term ending April 30th, 2022. I'll second. All right. Any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Welcome Thank to you. Waterbury. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for stepping up. Good luck. Thank you. Library Director's Quarterly Report. Oh, me. Yeah. yeah. We 
don't keep you waiting long. <laughs> So how goes the library business? Very well. Good. I brought you some more swag. These are some, we have information in the library about ticks. You might have read recently that Vermont has the highest per capita rate of Lyme disease. So we have, anyway, we have those. And some other information at, at the, um, in the cafe for our patrons. Well, it's good those to know handy, first at something. Those are handy wallet cards. So. so I'll introduce myself, as I was told to last time. Almy Landauer, Library Director. Good evening. Thank you for uh, giving me some of the time, some time on your agenda. I appreciate it. Is this close enough? So I'm going to start with some highlights from the second quarter, which is April, May, June. Uh, I wasn't able to work out coming to a meeting in July, so it's a little bit in arrears. But um, And then I have a handout for you with some basic statistics to give you a look at uh, the use of the library by taxpayers and community members. So as you know, with the support of the select board and Bill and the voters, we added a much needed 25 hour a week position at the library this year. Um, so thank you for supporting the library budget to enable us to do that. Uh, it's been wonderful for both the staff and the patrons uh, to have two consistent people at the help desk. We had, we had a 20 hour, we still have a 20 hour a week person and now we have a 25, so that is really helpful. Um, we received about 20 resumes for the position, which I narrowed down to a pool of six. And then with the staff, we reviewed them together, and we ended up interviewing four candidates. Uh, we hired uh, Maggie Cleary, and she's been a great addition to the staff. Uh, everyone is benefiting from being able to focus on their specialized areas while she covers the desk and answers the phone, um, with help, of course. But um, And I think community members are benefiting by having consistent people at the help desk when they walk in the door to greet them and help them. Um, so um, thank you again for that, everybody. During the second quarter, with the help of the Friends of the Waterbury Public Library and some new volunteers that I recruited, we launched an ongoing book sale in the library uh, and also a paperback exchange, which means there's no checkouts, there's no, you don't need to return them. They're great for taking on an airplane or going to the beach or whatever. Um, it's been very popular, both of those things. Um, all of the funds from the ongoing book sale go to the Friends of the Library. In the youth area, we've added some new educational and fun items for um, families to, to interact with when they come in. Um, we, uh, we have now have a craft table that always has something out for young children to do. Uh, we purchased some new toys, uh, new puzzles, new imaginative play items to liven up the youth area. Uh, and those have been very well received by our families with young children. And uh, we also got a donation of a train set with a table big, big table and Thomas the Tank Engine train parts, which if you have kids or grandkids, you know what those are. Um, and that will be, uh, right now that's in storage, it will be alternated with the craft table every few months. Uh, let's see. Most of the staff attended the one day Vermont Library Association Conference on May 21st, which is an annual conference. Uh, and each of us attended workshops that provided continuing education and inspiration for our particular area of librarianship. Uh, and it's always great to network with the other librarians in the state as well. Um, the day before that was the Vermont Library Trustee Conference, May 20th, and four of our commissioners attended, which is quite remarkable. We have really dedicated people on the board right now. Um, 
we all, I went as well, and we all heard from some nationally recognized leaders in library development and community engagement and had the opportunity to network with other experts and trustees and commissioners from around the state. Um, also in the area of training, our technology librarian, Delia, spent a day receiving some specialized training to work on the back end of our open source catalog and patron management system software. So that's going to be helpful to us as well as to the rest of the consortium that we belong to. Um, most of you probably know about the word garden that's out back. Uh, it's a very popular spot in the warmer months. Uh, we see a lot of people out there uh, using it, bringing kids to it. Um, and this spring we solicited suggestions for new words to add to the word garden from patrons. And then with support from the friends, we added 10 new words etched on rocks. And it's always fun to go out there and see the ever-changing phrases and poems that people write out there. Um, the other thing that I've been working on is increasing the visibility of the library and increasing the integration of the library into the community. Um, some of the projects I've worked on um, include helping with the seasonal preparation of the Rusty Parker Park. Uh, I volunteered at the Arts Fest and I've scooped free ice cream a couple of times at the concerts in the park with the Rotary Club. Uh, we've also partnered with ORCA, which is our local access uh, television uh, cable station. Um, and they have uh, taped and broadcast and archived some of our adult programs. So far, they've done three. And um, they seem to really like what we do. And they've created a Waterbury Public Library slot on their series channel uh, where they um, archive those so that anybody can watch if you can't come to the library or if you missed a program, some of them will be, uh, will be uh, taped there and you can watch them at your leisure. And they, there's more to come. They've done three so far. We had um, Trooper Keith Lu uh, Luya come to our staff meeting to meet all the staff so that we would know each other, uh, introduce ourselves, um, and had an a interesting discussion on how the police can help us if the need arrives and how, need arises and how we contact them. Uh, and Jill Chase, our assistant librarian, and I participated in the tabletop emergency exercise with the rest of the town and the Vermont emergency management people. Uh, I worked with Washington County Mental Health and the Vermont Network on Sexual and Domestic Violence to get pocket cards, brochures, and other information about their services and the assistance that they provide to people uh, into the library. So we have some in the bathrooms and some on, in various locations around the library for people to take. And my last highlight in this department is that every new patron now receives a welcome letter, mostly an email, uh, after they register for a library card, uh, which highlights the products and services and information that they can access through us which they also hear about when they sign up, but this is a nice digital reminder. So uh, programming is one of the most important ways that we fulfill our mission in a 21st century library, um, promoting lifelong learning and building, building community. And I wanted to just highlight some of the, some of the programs that we held during the second quarter. Uh, we, we had a race conversations, which is an ongoing, a uh, monthly meeting that grew out of uh, a program that we presented from the Vermont Humanities Council. Uh, and the people who attended wanted to continue the conversations. Um, we regularly get 15 to 16 people coming to those. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, we also have a writer's workshop that, again, started with one program. And the people who attended wanted to continue to work together. Uh, so that meets monthly. And there's about six to eight regular people that come to that. Um, and we also offer uh, cardio tai chi or some other similar movement class once a week, and that has a regular following as well. And then for single events, uh, we did things like an introduction to trout fishing, um, a program on invasive plants in Vermont, a program on composting, some needle felting classes, and a program called Black Bears Do's and Don'ts, with it, which if you're on Front Porch Forum, you'll know that's an issue in town these days. 
So those were all very well attended with anywhere from 25 to 40 people. In the children's area, we offered a nature walk with the Vermont State Zoologist, a couple of Dungeons and Dragons programs, after school crafts, maker programs. We have two story times a week. Uh, and in June, Michelle held mostly drop-in type programs because she was prepping for a summer reading program. So we would have Legos and different things out in the cell room for families to, to come in and do or after school uh, children to, come, to do. We also offer technology workshops. Our technology uh, librarian is Delia and she offers a monthly class on a variety of tech topics. And this, in that quarter she did one on using Instagram, uh, another one on how to organize your computer files, and another one on cutting the cable cord, which means streaming services for television content. Um, and she had anywhere from 10 to 17 people attend those. She also offers one-on-one -on -one technology help to by appointment. Um, and during that second quarter, she had 40 appointments for those one-on-one -on -one sessions. So those are pretty popular. Um, so I collect a lot of statistics monthly and, and quarterly, uh, which I send to the commissioners each month. Uh, and I have a handout, as I mentioned before, with just a few of the basics um, for you to look at. And I'm happy to answer any questions. that many people, so. So that's a little summary of the second quarter at the library. Now I realize that looking at statistics for one quarter is a little bit out of context as so you have no basis for comparison, but as time moves on, um, I'll be able to provide um, other months, other years, uh, as I collect the same statistics each month, and um, I think that will, that will be more helpful to see the ups and downs. I find it most helpful to compare the same quarter with the same quarter or full year to full year, so. That will, I'll start providing that in the future. You're just coming up on a year yourself now. Right? I am, yes, the end of this month will be a year. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, your book sale uh, program and how that actually works? And sure. So we take donations with some strict guidelines so that we're not overwhelmed with um, people cleaning out their attics. And um, we have, uh, we put them in a storage place in the library and our volunteers come in and they mark them with the date and clean them and so on if needed. And then they go on a cart, which is uh, in, the, in the hallway outside the stairwell door for now. Uh, and there's a sign there showing or telling people how much the different items cost, hardbacks, paperbacks, DVDs, audiobooks. Uh, and then they pay for them at the front desk and uh, when there's a friends meeting, I bring them the uh, funds that came in for that month. So. And the friends also have uh, have um, decided to pay for the installation of a extra little bookcase uh, upstairs that will be the book sale. So it doesn't have to be on a temporary cart, but that's it's currently being built. It'll probably be here in a month or so. Do you, do you typically get a fair amount of books? Well, we, it's, it's been pretty nice. It's been, um, people have been respecting our, our guidelines, and so we've gotten some nice donations, but we have not been, for the most part, overwhelmed. There was one time where we got, to, we got to the library in the morning and there were, I don't know, five boxes outside our door, which we knew that would happen now and then. I volunteered since I live near Goodwill to take those kinds of things away, <laughs> so I did that. So this, this book sale is sales of material that people are donating for? For the book sale. For the book sale. Mm -hmm. It's not, you're not selling books that have been purchased by the library in the past. We occasionally will put in a, a discarded item in there. Um, 
Uh, in my experience in book sale, library book sales, those don't sell very well. Um, so if they sit on the for sale cart for a certain amount of time, then we'll put them out on the free bench in the foyer. But mostly it's donations. So did you, did you take your <coughs> sign down that said we're not accepting donations? We changed the sign, okay. yes, and it has all the guidelines Good. at the front door and also at the book sale. <coughs> so you've never had any uh, writers of any books donate, you know, a, a certain number of their books to sell to help the library or anything like that? Then? Not, not here so far. Uh, well, let's see. We we did have um, Andrea Soberman, I think her last name is, who does musical munchkins in town. She donated one of her CDs, but we put that in the collection. So it's not unheard of for an author to donate a book to a library. Sometimes we get them in the mail. So some of those might go in the book sale if they're not appropriate to be put into our collection. Yeah. Does that, does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if you could get an author of a top rated book to come in and donate a couple hundred books. Probably not. <laughs> Their publisher probably would frown on yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Got to get them out and advertise them out. <laughs> All set, board? Yep. All right. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Okay, a request for a 5K fun run on August 15th. We might be requesting that. So I'm Donna Spires. Um, I'm a member of Central Vermont Runners and Vermont Suffrage Centennial Alliance. And uh, next year is 100 years since the passage of the 19th, or the ratification of the 19th Amendment allowing women to vote. And uh, the League of Women Voters are kind of spearheading the effort, but we've got a group that's meeting to plan events and educational outreach throughout the state for all of 2020. Um, it's actually even sort of started now. Middlebury has an, uh, college has an exhibit about it. And um, so as a runner, I propose that we have uh, a 5K to, you know, get people together and um, probably have some period costume and period type, you know, placards, not 2020, 1920 <laughs> placards. And, uh, and, and have it as sort of a fun run walk. And I was trying to think of a good place and the Leaf Peepers 5K course is the one that starts at the state office complex. It, it hasn't been held on this course for a few years since Irene, but it's coming back this year. I think the permit's been approved through you guys. So it, it leaves the state office complex, goes uh, north on Main Street, circles around through Duxbury, comes back across the Winooski Street Bridge and on the Cross Vermont Trail back to the state office complex. It, uh, the, the big question that I would see is we don't know how many people will come because this is a one-time event just as a, you know, a celebration. I, it could be 50 people, it could be 500. I would consider it a success if it was 100 to 200 people in the event. Um, it'd be great if there were more, um, but I don't know how far our outreach will go. And so if it is a few hundred people, we'll probably need to hire a sheriff or a, somebody for traffic control as we leave Main Street. Um, but it should only impact Waterbury traffic for, um, you know, five or ten minutes, and they wouldn't necessarily even have to completely stop, although if that one lane going north on Main Street were available. I don't know exactly what the state of construction is going to be next summer, but um, if it's doable this fall, it should be doable August 15, 2020, I hope. 
And so, um, so we were just trying to get the permits in line with Duxbury and Waterbury, and, uh, and we have a tentative permit with the state. So I, I just was wondering what the procedure is for getting a permit here. Just asking a question. <laughs> okay. The board can approve it. Um, you know, the, as you indicated, the Leaf Peepers Half Marathon is coming back to that traditional course. Right. We were here a couple of months ago. The board approved that. So uh -huh. it's really just to ask and hope that they nod their heads. <laughs> So this must be an RSVP type run. Is that what you're kind of? People will register yeah. in a, They have to register in advance because we're not allowed to sell anything on state property. So uh, that would include registration. Well, so, yeah. Give you a good indication of how yeah. many people yeah. are going to be. So doing. we'll know. You know, we'll know beforehand. I mean, uh, registration. It's just now. It's a year in advance. We haven't announced it. But we should know in advance to be able to plan for any additional traffic control or parking that we need to plan for. How do we typically make the decision whether or not we request sheriff support? Do we ever do it on based on number or? Um, for most of the races, runs, or bicycle rides, we, we do typically ask for uh, at least a sheriff to help escort them out of town. Okay. Uh, this course really doesn't have any crossing of Main right. Street. You're, you're heading south on Main Street, crossing the bridge. Oh, I said north, I meant south. <laughs> right. Cross, right, crossing the bridge yeah. at the south end and then yeah. going over right. The back side of the river and then turning around and coming back to Winooski Street Bridge, right? Right, so yeah, yeah, we don't do any turnaround, it's just one loop. So we, um, the 5k course, oh, it will, it, it, it is exactly 5k going from the state house south on Main Street, uh, into Duxbury, back on River Road in Duxbury, and right on Winooski Street Bridge, and back through oh, Crossroads. Okay. I, I just helped certify that course and. It's amazingly 5K. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So that really doesn't, I mean, that's why we're hopeful for Duxbury, because it is difficult in their town when we have an, a turnaround within one road, because then you've got runners going both ways. Um, but with this, there will be some slower traffic, because there will be walkers and runners, but because it'll be less competitive, I believe but um, more participatory, but it's only one direction, and so it's easier to keep people herded to the correct side of the road when they're only making right-hand turns. So how far in advance will you expect to close registration? Probably about a week in advance. Okay. So the 15th is a Saturday, right? Right. Okay. I mean, maybe you could approve it and then just direct, what was your name again? Donna. 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 Uh, or somebody from the race to, you know, just touch base with municipal staff uh -huh. a week or two before the race. We can find out maybe two weeks before. You'll have a good idea. We'll have at a good idea by then. <clears throat> how many there are, and then you know, if we can just talk and say, you know, you need to have one sheriff, two sheriffs, right. whatever. I think that's easy. To leave. And and based on having an entry fee. You know, if we get double the people, it's easy to pay for double the sheriffs. Right. Um, it's if it, if it's only 50 people, it's like it gets expensive. But I think we should have a lot of people. We're trying to invite historic societies and um, and and people across the state to just participate as sort of a celebration. The the major celebration is actually going to be the next Saturday in Montpelier. There's going to be a big parade and speakers on the state house lawn. Um, it's that's because that's it was ratified August 26. This is sort of a lead up to help get people interested. What, what time of day? Um, so I was looking at uh, either 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. I think 9 a.m. is probably best for traffic on a Saturday morning. Um, and probably a little better for heat in, on, in mid August. Uh, but if there was any things going on in town where that wasn't a problem, 
uh, where it would be a problem to start at 9 a.m. We'd probably go to 10 a.m. Um, there's not going to be, uh, yeah. Is there the farmers market in Waterbury is Thursday? Thursday, yeah. So that's not a problem. And I noticed there's some parade happening in the next couple of weeks on Main Street when I came in. I don't know. <laughs> is that so August 10th? The that's only, I guess, it's hard to tell. Um, I just want to make sure it's not not the same weekend that the car, car show. show is. That's, That's usually the second week. Car show would be starts this Friday. Yeah, I, I know year, this though. week, but I'm thinking oh. about next year. So uh, is it, it, if yeah. it's the same weekend, is it usually the second Saturday the car so. show? Yeah, so that would be so okay. that'd be the eighth. So it won't conflict. Mm -hmm. Check that one out. Yeah. I'll just note to look up <clears throat> car show. Uh, because they have that on Saturday? It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. OK. Is that what the, uh, where it said something about the road being closed yes. on August 10th? That's for the car show. Okay. Yeah. I saw that, and I thought, ooh, that's close. But it, hopefully it's not. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. overlap. If they do it the second, the second Saturday of the month every year, then it won't be a problem. A do, week you, earlier. do you know the name of the organization that does that? Yeah, the enthusiasts. Vermont. Automobile enthusiasts. Vermont automobile enthusiasts. Okay. That way I can probably go to their site and make sure that it's not going to be a conflict. So Donna, what's the title of the organization <laughs> that's putting this on? Well, Central Vermont Runners is producing it because we produce races and have insurance to put on races. Um, but Vermont Suffrage Centennial Alliance, VSCA, um, I sent I have the, uh, the proposal here with our information on it. I emailed it to Carla. Yeah, I emailed and, it to okay. and, uh, We did. <laughs> well, I mean, if it is period specific, you might be able to find cars of that era. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. I should let them know. <laughs> I guess women were allowed to drive then, right? <laughs> Um, I'll make a motion to approve the 5K fun run for the morning of August 15th, 2020, with the request that uh, you touch base a couple weeks out um, to coordinate any police um, directional requirements. I did have one final question. I'll second it and then. Uh, I'll second it. Uh, what, we just, what is your plan for sweeping the course afterwards? Oh, you know, uh, we. Um, we usually just go through, and, because we'll, we will have some markers and a uh, water station out there, so we'll clean up any okay. uh, any mess there. And definitely, we have to clean up anything near the state house. That's part of the plan. Okay. When are you meeting with Duxbury, or has that already happened? Um, I'm on their schedule for August 26th. Okay. Do we need to say p pending them, their approval as well? Okay. Yeah. No, if they don't get approval from Duxbury. <laughs> if we can't get approval from Duxbury, we go back to the drawing board. Yeah, figure out a course in water, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we did before, but people didn't like Perry Hill. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> we lost half our entrance. <laughs> okay, well, a motion's been made um, to authorize a request for the 5K fund run and seconded. And if there's any, no further questions or comments, all those that wish to approve say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Do you want Anna? the uh, hard copy of the map or the, um, or the proposal, or you got the one email? Set. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bill, the rest of the night is yours. Yeah, it better not take till then. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You're going to be done early? I said, well, you never know. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> at the last meeting, we uh, we had a budget report of the operating funds, and uh, 
anybody else want one? I gave one to. Um, I gave a, a report of the operating funds, and Mark asked about the uh, CIP funds. So the the budget budget uh, for the funds 70 through 75 is the traditional CIP funds, and then I've also included uh, fund 76 and 82, which are not capital improvement funds, but they're special purpose funds for the municipal building operating fund and the uh, money that we spend for the economic development director. Uh, there's really not a lot to update you on right now. Uh, spending <clears throat> is fairly slow at the moment. So uh, on the paving fund, um, if you look at the first page where the heading is, uh, I did tell you last week that we've paved East Street, and, and that's what the $40,000 year to date is there. We're preparing to pave Loomis Hill uh, any time now. Uh, the two uh, big culverts just above Hubbard Farm Road uh, were changed out last week, and there's some, uh, you know, final work that needs to be done on that. Uh, I don't have with me um, what ST Paving's schedule is, but ST Paving will be doing the work. I had hoped to ask Bill Woodruff this afternoon, and uh, we had five water leaks on the Main Street project today, so he was pretty busy out out there. Um, and I did see him briefly this afternoon, and I thought he was going down the hall to talk to Karen or Pam, and that he'd be back, but he must have gone home because I didn't see him again. Um, anyway, so Loomis Hill and, um, and then um, Jenny Davis Road are on on the schedule to be paved. Um, the infrastructure CIP, which is Fund 71, which is on the second page, um, <clears throat> that's the CIP fund that we'll be paying the Main Street project from. Um, the $61,000 that you can see there is from the beginning of the year to now. Some of that $61,000 will be reimbursed to us by the water and sewer departments of the utility district. So that number right now at 61000 is actually inflated over what it will turn out to be at the end. Um, we just have not made that transfer of funds yet. Um, up at the top under the revenues, I'm not sure what that miscellaneous uh, $3,858 of miscellaneous income is. Um, I'm uh, checking into that. That may be, uh, it may be in the wrong fund, but right now it's there. Um, we have not transferred any money from the operating funds to the CIPs yet, but it's all in the same checking account anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Um, sidewalk repair and replacement, uh, we budgeted 40, but even at the time we put the budget together, so you told me that she thought 40 was more than we were going to be able to do given what we had to do with regard to the paving and uh, the culvert improvements. So I've, I've projected 30. Uh, we've got to finish some sidewalks on Butler Street, I believe. The bridge improvement, and, and I handed you the memo that I wrote in, in uh, January, um, and all of the detail of what we're planning to do is included in that memo. I'm not going to read it or go through it um, at this point, but the $138,600 is for improvements of the bridge on Guptill Road that's closest to Dr. Maury's house. This is one of the items that I wanted to talk to Bill Woodruff about today. Um, we haven't done anything there yet, and uh, I know because I did look at the memo this afternoon, we had applied for a, for a state grant for that bridge. Um, I suggested in the memo that I didn't think we would get the grant. Uh, we have not received the grant, so it may be that we're not going to do that project at all uh, without the grant money. 
The culvert improvements, the $120,000, um, that's basically three major culverts, the two on uh, Loomis Hill that I just talked about that were replaced last week, and then the one on Perry Hill that we've been waiting for three years to get done. That's a FEMA-funded project, and that uh, $76,500 up at the top, uh, 52000 of that seventy six is earmarked for that uh, that culvert project. I did check with Alec and Bill Woodruff last week. That has been advertised for bid, and I believe bids are due uh, the third week of August. So we should be getting some information on that Perry Hill culvert uh, within a couple weeks, and then you know hopefully we've got a. We've been having a little issue with FEMA on that. Um, we've got an estimate, um, and FEMA's estimate for the for the job is is lower than ours. And um, you know we've been kind of going back and forth. So uh, FEMA estimated seventy thousand dollars for that, and our estimate is higher. Uh, if it's and what I finally asked FEMA to do was let us put it out to bid. If we got competitive bids and got a price, then they would accept it. If they're right and it's 70000 great. If not, I think they've agreed uh, tentatively to, to give us a grant, which will pay us the same percentage as it would at the $70,000 cost. Um, the, uh, let's see, six in that upgrade to structures and the expenses on uh, Fund 71, we budgeted $30,000. we have spent $16,667. Uh, that payment was to Kingsbury Construction, and that was for uh, doing a riprap job on uh, Little River Road going down uh, toward the state. Uh, you know, toward the state campground. Um, that project was budgeted at 30, so I'm not sure it's, I think it's complete, but I, again, I gotta check with Bill to find out if it is complete, um, the grant that we'll get for that project will be lower than what we anticipated. So that's why up at the top where the 76.5 is for state grants, and you can see I projected 65,833. And if it's the 65,833 is 80% um, of that 16,667, which is about $13,000. And then the balance would be the 52,000 for that project on Perry Hill. So um, <clears throat> I'll find out about the bridge improvement on Bridge 4 on Guffle Road. That's the that's the big outstanding question mark, whether or not we're going to get to that uh, project this year. Must have been a, <clears throat> anticipated a f fairly uh, extensive repair for um, yeah, price tag. We, <clears throat> we had uh, reconstruct the deck, add a membrane, paint, and repave. Um, and I said, we'll apply for a structures grant, not counting on getting the grant. And we talked about that earlier because of you know, the Main Street project and a number of the grants we've received recently from the state. It's kind of not our turn right now. Um, turning the page to the Highway Vehicle Fund, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, we're planning to buy three things this year. We've made two purchases so far. They're right. Uh, just above and below the uh, budgeted price. The, the pickup truck with the snow fighting equipment is yet to come. We'll have that before the, before the winter. So there's nothing, nothing magical about that fund. Fire vehicle CIP this year, the next one, there's no expenditures in that except paying debt on the um, rescue truck and the power truck and that debt we're paying to ourselves, so nothing there. The recreation CIP, um, I do want to spend a minute on this one. Um, 
And if you turn to page three of the memo, uh, I don't think that I remembered to color. So to the right there, and the, the, you, can, you can see there's a handwritten note there. That's what I'm talking about. So we had budgeted to spend $76,500, uh, but that budget was going to work only if we received that VOREC grant. We applied for a $50,000 VOREC grant. Chris's daughter took it away from us and it went to Newport instead. Uh, so we didn't get the money. Wait till I see her. Um, so um, the, we, we had intended to spend $27,000 in the rec building, and that was to um, upgrade the bathhouse uh, changing rooms and do some plumbing in there. We were going to put a roof on the building, a new roof, and then we were going to build a, a shelter, a sun shelter, out in the, you know, at the shallow end of the pool for a couple thousand dollars. We were going to do uh, field improvements, uh, which was going to include um, lights at the softball field, uh, at the tennis court, uh, and then um, some signage. We were going to put a lift in the pool for persons with disabilities, uh, playground improvements at Rusty Parker Park, which we did, and then some basketball hoops, and then some work at Whistle Mountain on some trail work. So uh, we did not get the grant, and um, the $35,000 was supposed to take care of lights at both the softball field and the tennis courts. Um, I mean, the, the field improvements, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the lights at the softball field, the parking lot. Um, for 5,000 at Dacro, the signage for 1,500, and then the lights, 28,500, and that was to be at Dacro and the, the tennis courts. Um, we didn't get the grant. You can see we, we spent 33,114. The 33,114 in field improvements that we've spent is almost all, in fact, I think it is all the lights at Dacro alone. And we've still got um, $6,000 to spend there. And then we'll get a rebate from uh, Efficiency Vermont for about $4,400 on the lights. So we're going to spend just about $35,000 on the lights at DAC Row. And uh, that's significantly higher than we anticipated. We thought we could do the lights at both places. The problem that we had was when we started the project with the lights here, uh, we knew that we had some issues with the electrical service itself, but we had more issues with uh, the electrical lines under the ground. They weren't, they weren't in proper conduits. Uh, they were not up to code. So we had to spend money to just make the thing safe. Uh, we changed the, uh, there's a new panel out at, right here. We came off of the electrical service right where that um, banner pole is out here in the front. So there's a new service there. We went underground out to that pole that you can see there. There's a scaffolding around, around that pole that's in uh, left center field. And the electrical box is now, um, you've got to climb a ladder to get to it, so it's above the flood, which was another issue that the electrical inspector had, the one that was over uh, near the parking lot, surrounded by the cedar hedges, was underwater during Irene. So um, when we started the projects to, to do the lights, obviously we had to have the electrical inspector come and he found some issues with the, with the uh, fields, I mean, with the lights that were above and beyond what we knew that we had to do. The, the money in the project was to buy new lights and have a, an electrician install them, and we knew we needed to do a little work in the panel. We ended up having to do a lot of work in the panel, and um, it's a much safer system than it was before. 
uh, you just you got to bring it up to code. So anyway, you can see in that CIP, if in the left-hand column, uh, we predicted a, a ending fund balance of $6,200. We started the year with about $2,200 in the in the bank. Uh, we thought we were going to have about $4,000 more of revenue than we did expenses, and we would have a fund balance of $6,232. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the far right-hand column, uh, we did not get the $50,000 worth of grants, and um, you know we spent $25,000 or so less than we budgeted, but we received $50,000 less than we budgeted. So our fund balance is negative here. Um, I told you last week when we were looking at the operating funds that it's looking like the recreation uh, budget was the revenues were significantly higher than they were. I don't, until we get to the end of the year, um, I wouldn't be able to make a recommendation for this. I don't believe that I'm going to recommend transferring money from the operating funds this year into the uh, rec CIP this year in order to get this to zero. We have a number of these CIP funds that are um, negative fund balances already, so we'll have to deal with that as we go forward. You can see at the very bottom of that page that funds 70, 71, 72, and 75, um, <clears throat> all of these CIPs, we expected to have a year in combined fund balance of about $30,500. Right now it's projecting out to about $20,800. So um, it's not a significant move off of what our projections were before we went in. The year isn't done yet. There may be some things where I've projected that will be a little bit lower. We're going to end the year with a very, very modest balance in the CIPs, which is not any different than we thought we were going to have going into this year. So next year, if we're going to do significant paving or infrastructure projects next year, we're either going to have to transfer a lot more money from, um, well, not a lot more. I mean, we're, we basically, we're spending all the money every year that we put in. But next year, if we're going to do another big paving project, we've talked about Maple Street, it's probably uh, going to be necessary to consider borrowing if we're going to be able to, to, do, to do that. And we, we talked about that back in the spring. We already know, you know, we've got two pump trucks in the fire department that are coming. I'm working with Gary on that. What kind of, you know, does it make sense to buy two at once? and have a five or six thousand dollar savings in the construction of it, but understanding that in order to do that, we're going to have to borrow. I'm thinking that it's going to be October. I talked to Bill and Alec about um, putting together a paving and infrastructure plan for next year. We talked about maybe having a conversation with the public about whether we should change salt and sand use. Um, so maybe it would be a good time if, if I can get a firm date from Bill and Alec about when they would have um, some uh, potential things that we can discuss about infrastructure projects and paving projects to have that maybe at the same time and, and invite the public in then to kind of hear about it all at once. On Maple Street, um, <clears throat> I'm a little concerned with how that road has reacted over the years. The many humps, bumps in it, I mean, you drive down, it's just like you're on a railroad track. Um, I'm curious to know what's causing those in that road at such frequency if there's uh, underground water or there's no I don't know what's existing underneath that other than native soils um, I think that's probably what it, it's native soils I mean there's a few there's a few culprits on that road not many it's pretty flat on right. both sides 
Yeah, I, I really can't answer that question, Chris. I guess my concern is if we go, move ahead and spend all kinds of money to reconstruct that or repave that road, you know, what guarantees do we have that obviously probably the same thing's going to happen again. It's just how soon, you know, that's why I'm curious to know what's causing that and how soon that would rear its head again, uh, you know, five years down the road, 15 years down the road. It'd be nice to get a, maybe some soil samples or, I don't know, look into what's causing yeah, it. I, it's consistent all the way down that yeah, road. Is, I, I haven't, I haven't, I'm not saying I haven't noticed it now that you're mentioning it, I'm thinking about it, but I hadn't thought about it at all, really, right yet. Something to mention to Woody and Alex. Yep. What, what would they normally do, core? Like, do cores? Like, I know when they um, were doing the work up and down Stowe Street, they did a whole bunch of cores. Yeah. And they drilled down in and took sleeves of soil out. To yeah. Stowe. I know there's an incredible high season, or a uh, seasonal water table. Seasonal water table there. Um, yeah. So that could be the contributing factor, uh, and the fact that it's all gravel, that water is passing through that soil, and during the winter, those, I'm thinking that those are veins of water that are passing through the road that are freezing, creating those humps every so many feet. Um, that's right. the only thing I can come to the conclusion that it's causing that. But it'd be, you know, It'd be beneficial if maybe we could do a little bit of investigating as to what's causing that and whether or not we can even do anything about it. Um, speaking about the uh, uh, policy change, maybe, on how we treat our roads, um, uh, speaking with Nat the other day, we bumped into each other out at the uh, Sticks and Stuff store. Um, I had mentioned that um, Celia had approached me about the John Deere mower tractor oh. here just recently. Um, Fairfield is liquidating out their stuff for this year so they can buy new stuff. And the mower that we currently have rented is for sale for 90000 um, And I was asked to kind of bring that question to the board as to whether or not we might have interest in picking that up um, for that price as opposed to considering a new one under the you know considerations that we've been pressed by the public to perhaps mow our roadsides more frequently uh, to try to keep these invasives away and during that conversation of, of the tractor with Nat he made up a good point that if Depending on what that, how we could amortize that vehicle out, that tractor out, what if some policy changes, if there were policy changes made addressing the salt and sand use, what type of savings might be there to help offset the purchase of this tractor? And I said, well, that's, that's certainly worth considering. And, not, not to intentionally change the salt and sand use to benefit the purchase of the tractor, but if we're planning on changing how we uh, take care of our roads during the winter, what possible savings might go towards that uh, so that additional taxes wouldn't be needed. So I'm throwing it at the board to see what they have. What's our yearly spend on on average on average now we're renting it for a certain amount of weeks um, well if you want an answer you can I can I can go find that um, I, I don't know off the top of my head I can go look if you want it's not a problem um, let me do that so yeah we Chris can. Chris Chris uh, mentioned this in passing to me the other day. And, you know, so I think what you're asking is, B, 
because Fairfield is selling something for $90,000 that if we wait until next year after we go to town meeting to buy, we're probably going to spend 125 or 140 or something like that. For, yeah. So there's a $50,000 savings. Now, so they're selling machines that are used, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and the issue, of course, is we don't have the money in the budget. We, we didn't budget to buy this vehicle this year. Um, so I've been thinking about it a little bit, and I think the question that the board needs to kind of answer is, is it worthwhile owning a tractor versus renting a tractor? And while I, while I go and look, you can kind of knock this around yourselves. But, um, you know, if the answer is, you know what, we're getting somewhere between four to six weeks of mowing time now, renting, and we really ought to mow more because of the issues that are facing us, um, and we can buy something for 90 that's going to last 10 years. Should we do that versus waiting and then having to spend forty or fifty thousand dollars more? And if the answer is yes to that, then we have to figure out how do we do that without busting the budget and you know mm -hmm. talking to the voters about it. So let me go look first. Is this, the, is this the unit we're currently renting? Yeah. What, what's the feedback on its condition? Um, it's, I looked at it the other day. It's in spectacular condition. Of course, those roadside mowers, they basically, that's all they do. Right. Creep down the road, mow in the roadside, so there's not a lot of harsh use to them. Mm -hmm. um, that one's fully fitted with the mower and everything. So we were talking about buying, I have to remind myself, look, we were talking about buying one next year? Well, we had been considering, I've been interested in the possibility of purchasing one now for more than a couple of years. Uh, yeah, depending on the, li the life expectancy of, let's just say, a brand new one or a used one versus what we're paying a year, could we, do we have labor capacity to be able to mow more? Do we know? Yeah. Okay. We do. So if we had one more, we could do more. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Which would mean it would be more rental fee if you were comparing owning versus Right. I mean, if, you were, if we were to mow like we probably should be mowing, and we had to rent to do that, yeah, our cost of rent would be substantially more. Um, what goes wrong with these things? Well, it's that tractor of mine that I've had, and I've used it for everything, it's 65 horse New Holland. It's not as big as that John Deere. That John Deere, I think, is uh, what well, looks to be a 100 horse. Um, I mean, I've used mine for brush hogging. I've used it for haying. I've used it for grading roads. I've used it for loading trucks. I've used it, you know, the one that the town's rented right now doesn't have a loader on it. So that doesn't get, you know, it wouldn't be used for anything like that. But uh, I've, I've, I don't even know how many years I've owned mine and I've never had to put a penny into it. Um, they're pretty durable machines, you know, especially like I said, all these guys are doing is they're creeping down the road, mowing the roadside, so there's not a lot of... It's not working very hard. Yeah, they're not getting beat to death by any stretch. Um, and if we, I mean, Let's say we, you know, bought this thing on some kind of finance plan. Um, well, I, well, the first thing I would want to ask Fairfield is if they would, if we talked to them about purchasing this thing, if they would consider putting the rent money that we've already given them oh, towards, towards the purchase. Oh. That would be a help to us, you know, knock it off the top. So whatever, you know, if they want this summer, this summer, ninety thousand for it, yeah. Would be, and I I do that with my own equipment sometimes. If I'm buying a new piece, I'll rent it for a couple of months, and with the agreement that it comes off the top if I yeah. decide to purchase it. So uh, that may lower the cost down a little bit more. Um, I don't suspect 
probably that machine or any of the other ones they've got will probably stick around too long because of the condition they're in and basically all they're used for. So uh, I don't think they'd have any problems getting rid of them. It's not like they're going to be pulling their hair out wondering how they're going to sell it. Uh, we do have a local resident here tonight, uh, so I'd like to ask his opinion what he thinks about it. What do you think? About buying a roadside mower there, that John Deere that we've got up the town, Chad. Huh? How do you feel about that? Oh, I got <laughs> What's his name, Chris? Dave Dow. Yeah. Um, I mean, I value your opinion. Um, oh, do you think we do? You think we need to buy something like that, or do you think we're better off to continue to rent it, or what? No, to me, renting something's crazy. You know what I mean? To me, you buy it, and then it's yours, and you might just take care of it. <laughs> yeah. I think it makes sense to run high-cost equipment that we're using very little. But I think it makes sense for something like this. If we're using it that many weeks in a summer, and it's relatively low maintenance, I'm sure there's a savings over time. That's why I want to talk to Bill, too, about the question on the, the fire equipment and are we still talking about the potential of use too because we talked about it a little bit but you know there's definitely municipalities that are turning their equipment over sooner and I know we've bought used in the past for some of our current equipment and we've held on to it for a number of years maintained it well and you know you know about the two pump trucks. yeah but like if we're talking about spending 90 here Maybe we don't need, you know, like sure, there might be a $6,000 savings or whatever it is over two, but that that spend is half a million or, or a million or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd rather start talking about used equipment too in that conversation. <laughs> That's going to be an uphill battle with, with <laughs> yeah, Mr. I'm Miller. sure. Yeah. <laughs> I can guarantee that. So um, we pay Fairfield $3,200 a week to rent that machine. A week. A week. Uh, yes. Six so weeks. We, three weeks this year. Ninety six hundred dollars is. So what we're we, spending ten grand a year. About yeah. That's a lot more than I thought. Well, to Mark's point, if we have it, we'll be using it a lot more. So that savings right. will hmm. certainly increase. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're getting three weeks worth of it now, and like I told you before, you know, we're waiting now until. <laughs> into so June and we're trying to cut things before it goes to seed and we got a an email from uh, um, oh what's his name Mike yeah Hedges, Hedges um, from the you know he's on the conservation fund and he thanked us for yeah. getting this most of it cut before it went to seed but it's always close you know and uh, depends on the year if it isn't quite so wet, and it's a little warmer, maybe it goes to seed faster, and we could get out and mow it in. You is know, that, is that close because... First of May, the first, second May. week of May is when you should be hitting it. Is that close because we have a scheduled date that we get to pick it up and return it so they can build their schedule for the rental of that equipment? Yeah, I think, I, I think that, you know, um, I'm sure she can move it around, but when we've gotten it of late, it's... I, I know that that schedule isn't as flexible as you'd like it to be because every other town's, you know, want the damn thing too, so. Right. Uh, <clears throat> where if we had our own, then there's no questions. We mow when we want to mow, and we don't have to deal with, you know. Kind of, what kind of lifespan do you think a machine like that would have? Oh. What do you, I mean? If, if it, Taking, that, care, that's that's taking care of properly, <laughs> that, she, that machine will last us 15 years in a heartbeat. Easily. So it sounds like if you could figure out a way to make the money flow work, you'd be getting an, an extra five years of rental. Yeah, over time, over time it would be fiscally responsible to, to do this. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd get... You'd save five years of rental, yeah. plus, plus you'd be able to use it, you know, right. you'd be able to use it for 30 weeks a year if you needed to. Do we, and we have the ability to store something like this right now, or would it set, is it set out? I think we could find a place to put it. 
Uh, the Omri up yeah, behind the school. Okay. Um, huh. So, Bill, could you? I know we've been in this situation before, where and, and maybe it was the sidewalk sander, but you know, out of out of budget season, <coughs> spend considerations and what our options might be. Um, yeah. While you were out of the room, we were also just talking about as we look to consider this. Um, you know, conversations surrounding other large equipment and are we talking about used equipment as well, which I know we've done in the past. But just as we're, we try to figure out if, if, if we're really adding or if there are offsets. Yeah. Um, so I think it was just a, a year or so ago where we, um, we had to buy the sidewalk plow uh, it just, it wasn't worth putting any more money in. We were hoping to get one more year of it, out of it. It wasn't in the budget. Um, so in that case, we already owned a piece of equipment and it was just not worth repairing it. Um, in this case, we don't own it. So if we go and, if we go and buy it, in a, there's a, you could subject yourself to a little criticism that the public says, hey, we didn't even get a chance to decide whether we wanted to own it, never mind mm -hmm. did we want to spend $90,000 on it. Um, but I think the reality is, is that we need to do roadside mowing. Um, and, you know, you can... You know, the old saying is, you know, it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to get permission. You know, you go to the voters next year and you say, hey, we had an opportunity. Um, we're going to buy this anyway. We're going to ask you to buy it anyway. And, uh, you know, somewhere between thirty and $50,000 is, is what we've saved on this, and, and we can do it. Um, you know, we can, if we had to, we could finance it at least initially, could borrow the money. Uh, from ourselves, basically. We could borrow the money from ourselves or from the village, uh, and, and, then, uh, and then, you know, next year you could decide whether it's reasonable to just continue to finance it or if you wanted to just outright purchase it. Um, I know, and I'm, I'm on a little shaking ground here, um, Leasing is not considered a purchase, so you don't you don't need voter approval to lease something. The board can just say, "We there's a piece of equipment out there. Let's we need it. We're going to lease it. Uh, you haven't purchased it." I think to go to Fairfield and go through their system to lease, you're going to eat. You know, you're not going to eat up forty thousand dollars worth of savings, but. I think you just either decide to buy it uh, and tell me to figure out a way and in terms of cash flow to make it work and then go to the voters next year and say, we did this because, and um, you know, if they, if they decide that they're not happy about it, they can take something else out of the budget, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think the, the real issue is you need to decide whether it's you know, good for the community to own it. And if it is, and the savings really is, and, and I don't know, I'm, I'm just going from our conversation, but um, if we can buy this for 90 and we, we're going to buy a brand new one next year, this is probably a couple years old. If I look at it the way I look at my own business, you know, uh, if I needed a piece of equipment like that and I knew for the next 10 to 15 years I'd be spending $150,000 to rent it and I could cut my losses and pony up and get an extra five, six years of use out of it, at, you know, at the end when I'm all done, I, that's a no-brainer. Right, and this isn't a business that has an end. You know, we're going to continue to need. It seems like a right. no-brainer. Yeah. yeah, no, we don't want to buy another piece of equipment, but this this kind of we're already spending money to rent one. We might as well own the darn thing. And we well, unfortunately we don't have the opportunity to. And you know, a 
last thing I would want to do is go over the voters' heads to do something like this, but in this particular case, Fairfield's not going to wait around for us to have a vote. No, that's, it might be going already. Right. How, how difficult is it, is an equi piece of equipment like this to find used on the used market in good condition, or is it, do you feel like it's worthy that this specific piece is worth doing this because they're diff it's difficult to find or the quality meets the, the right price? Like what's, while you were away too, Bill, um, Chris mentioned that, um, and I don't know if you wanted to be part of the negotiation, but the ask of our rental fee potentially being pulled off that 90,000, he's done it before. So that was another part of the conversation that happened while you were out of the room. Yeah, put what we've already given him this year towards the purchase. And the other thing I was just thinking here while we were having this conversation is, uh, can we squeeze any kind of a warranty out of them for a year, you know, give us a year's warranty on it, something like that. That's something else we could certainly uh, talk to them about as well. Um, the fact that Fairfield's been in the business of renting this type of equipment for a number of years now, um, in the, the quality business that they operate, I suspect they probably keep up on this equipment. Uh, fairly well when it comes to you know making sure it's all uh, you know greased and and oil changed and whatnot um, and I suspect they've probably made a fair amount of money on renting these machines uh, so to think that they're you know probably asking more than what it's worth is I, I wouldn't suspect. It's not like you're getting it from a private sale where you don't know what it's been through. Uh, Do we tonight, can we just, how, what? Oh, I feel like I'm right in there. Oh. You're in criticism. Um, can you hear me, Ann? Do you have any idea on how quickly, could we just put, put um, Bill on task to negotiate and come back and we vote on this at the next meeting, or do you think we need to consider approving an up to spend this evening? Well, I think if, if Bill could contact or Celia, whatever, Fairfield right off and ask them that question, you know, first I would negotiate with them first, whatever, and then, right. But uh, still, if, if they're not willing to wait for the next meeting, we can do we authorize well th i mean i i'm i'm you know i'm reluctant to have you authorize me anything because okay. no offense to anybody and it's their job but it could be in the newspaper what you authorize and yeah. that might that might in, yep. in yeah, yeah. on negotiating abilities so uh, what i can do is say to them you know, negotiate the best deal that I can and ask them, can you wait two weeks? To get the and if they can't, then, you know, right. you can hold a special meeting with, what, 48 hours notice? It, it wouldn't be an emergency meeting, yeah. but if we have to, we can call a, another select board meeting and have you come back and vote. Okay. Yeah, that's, that sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. Let's feel it out. So we don't have to actually... You don't have to do anything tonight except what we've done, and I'll just report back either at the next regular meeting or we'll call a special meeting. Yeah, okay. I mean, if they're actively trying to sell these things, who knows? <laughs> it may be already too late. We don't know. Right. Okay. Right, and if it is too late, there may be an opportunity somewhere else to get one. But I think you're right, the fact that if we're buying a machine that we've been using, that would be. Yeah, I mean, I'd, on the topic of this conversation and moving forward, I'd be interested in understanding what other items within our budget were the various, any similar scenarios, just to understand, you know, some of that for me, even being on the board for a while. Now I understand that there is a potential savings over a 10, 10 year period. It starts to make sense to review some of that. Yeah. yeah. Most of the stuff that we need we already own and they're already on yeah. a cycle for purchasing. You know, and we used to own one. We had a roadside mower in the past, two different models. Um, you know, I think I told you when I first came here, Howard Ripley used his fire model tractor or whatever it was and, you know, had a cutter bar on the side. And then we bought a 
we bought a big, a, remember that big blue, huge tractor they had with the rotary motor on, a, on an arm? We had that for a few years, and Howard used to love to put it vertical and <laughs> mow the trees. <laughs> I see Dustin actually trimming back some of the brush here the other day, and I was thinking to myself, yeah. there you go, buddy. And then, uh, and then we used, we bought an attachment for the trackless sidewalk plow that we have, and we used that. It had an over the rail, you know, a, a good mower, but just the way the machine is built and that weight on that arm, yeah. it just it it did a whole lot of damage in it. It wreaked havoc with the with the sidewalk plow and yeah. never never worked out. So we have had them in the past. Yeah. It's just so anyway. Okay. <laughs> I don't have anything else to present unless you we, have questions. We didn't get all the way through the CIP stuff. Um, okay, we finished on the recreation, I think, uh, and then the the last page uh, funds seventy six and eighty two. 76 is just the Municipal Building Operating Fund. Uh, looks like we're gonna maybe have a little um, money left over at the end of this year in that fund, um, but that can change. Uh, revenues are right on line to what we projected, which is the two main revenues are just property tracks tax transfers. Um, and then we must be a little low on a couple of the, the building maintenance line right now. Um, I'm not sure if there's something that, it almost looks like there's something obviously big that is coming at the end of the year. So I'm not sure that 26, 8, 19 that it's projecting out to is right since we budgeted 35 for building maintenance, and I didn't happen to see that until just now. But um, if we do spend the full 35 there, then would be about $5,000 in the hole. But I, I think this fund will come out pretty close to where we expected it. It's, it's um, getting more and more um, predictable as time goes on. Um, because some of the projects that were a little bit unknowable in terms of exact exact uh, costs, like the new equipment line, that was mainly the generator and then some computer server work. So anyway, and then the LDC is just an in and out. We transfer money. I think next year I won't even bother having the reason why this was this fund was set up was because there were two funding sources: the, the village and and the town were funding the economic development director. But uh, even before the village dissolved, the town ended up taking over all of the economic development directors. So we can make accounting simpler and just have the one line item in the general fund and pay. Uh, revitalizing Waterbury directly out of that. But that's what that fund is. So unless you have any questions, I'm all set for now. So that building maintenance fund, that's for all the buildings in general? This building. Oh, it's just for this one? Yeah, municipal building operating fund. So that's um, the building maintenance would be the lawn work, um, the janitorial services in this building, um, HVAC maintenance, that, all that kind of stuff is in that uh, building maintenance line. Okay. That is all set. Yep. All right, make a motion to get out of here. I'll make a motion. I'll second. All that, all that wish to approve, say aye. 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 Thanks, Ann.